from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Three main pressure points are transforming the modern data landscape. First, increased interest in adopting open table formats to allow any compute to operate on any data. Second, the point of control is actually shifting from the DBMS to the governance layer. And third, AI is enabling the emergence of a new class of intelligent data apps that promise to radically automate business processes and drive unprecedented levels of productivity. Databricks and Snowflake are two firms locked in what sometimes appears to be an internecine battle. But our research shows, in fact, that their fiercely competitive nature is adding value for customers in ways that increase innovation while at the same time supporting corporate edicts around AI safety, governance, and data security. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, our colleague Eric Bradley and I share fresh results from a survey of more than 100 joint Databricks and Snowflake accounts. The data we present will show that customers remain conflicted on how to best rationalize their need to balance data trust with the desire to move fast and innovate. And as such, the war of the data roses may not be a zero sum game. Eric Bradley, welcome to Breaking Analysis. Thank you, Dave, for having me. This is a fun survey to do with you. Yeah, I can't wait to really dig in here. All right, let's first set the table and share the demographics of uh, the survey, the intent of why we did this survey and some of the relevant tidbits. Um, Let's kind of riff on this, Eric, and, and I'd like to start off with 105 respondents from joint Databricks and Snowflake accounts. People, people on Twitter were saying, well, that's a relatively small end, but these are joint accounts. We did this very, very rapidly. Give us your take on the sample that you chose. Yeah, certainly. So I'm um, sure 100 is not as big as our usual quarterly survey, which is in the thousands, but it didn't need to be for this instance. So what we did here is uh, we had about 500 customers cite uh, spending attention on Snowflake and about 300 on Databricks in the J July uh, thesis that we just closed a couple of weeks ago. So what we did is we decided to go find 100 of them that are customers of both. Uh, the purpose being we wanted to see how they were being used. What were the different use cases when they were being used in the same organization? And out of this 100, Dave, we've got roughly a half of the global 2000 and about a third of the Fortune 500. So this is certainly a great representation of large budget customers that use both of these companies. Great, and, and if you bring that back up, Alex, we, we're doing this ahead of SuperCloud 7, which takes, next, take, takes place next week uh, uh, in Palo Alto. Some other you know, quick tidbits here, 96% of these are uh, customers, these joint customers are deeply involved in the data platform decision-making. The other 4% maybe weren't involved in decision-making, but they used the platforms on a, on a regular basis. There were a lot of other platforms in use, Eric, Azure Synapse, 37%, uh, Redshift, big, you know, Amazon Redshift, 35%, BigQuery, right up there at 32%. And then you had these sort of data mesh, Starburst-like, Trino, uh, lake houses at 22%. At so a lot of other uh, platforms out there. And 80% of the respondents are using some kind of on-prem and hybrid platforms, SQL Server, Oracle, Mongo, Couchbase, SAP HANA, MySQL, uh, MariaDB was in there. We're not listing it here, Teradata, Postgres. And then uh, we're going to get into this heavily about the importance of security, the importance of govern governance. And a lot of people said they don't make decisions without considering these two factors. And then a number, a big number, 48% of the respondents said they plan to shift in some way their Databricks or Snowflake, AI, ML, data mix and spending. Eric, so, you know, quick snapshot of the survey. Anything else you'd add before we jump to the next one? I'll, I'll tell you, I think it was super interesting to see that number on BigQuery, right? I don't think we were surprised with uh, Microsoft Azure or, or Redshift, but that number of BigQuery was very, very close behind those. And our recent data showed a jump in Google, not just in cloud, but also on the data stack uh, and in MLAI in particular. So just really an interesting data set that's not just in this survey, but also it was played out in our July thesis survey uh, actually led to us having a positive rating on that vendor uh, data set for the first time in a long, long time. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, let's take a look at what these joint customers are doing, what kind of workloads they're running on these data platforms. So we asked customers to share the, the specific use cases that we're showing here. Not surprisingly, Snowflake has the lead with data warehousing and storage while Databricks is, uh, their historical strength in AI shows up significantly here, machine learning as well. More so than even Snowflake's lead in data warehouse, despite what is Snowflake's history there. You know, we'll add that the emerging control point of data governance catalogs is both its early days, but as shown uh, by the data here, pretty close between the two firms and the new locus of value that we discussed in our intro, while favoring Databricks somewhat is the next big race to value that's around developing applications. But for the most part, uh, Eric, there's a slight advantage here for Databricks, uh, but other than the two areas that we've highlighted, you know, it's pretty neck and neck. What, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I hear so many people come to me, whether it's clients or media outlets that always want us to call this, you know, Databricks versus Snowflake. And it's not really the case in our data. It's Databricks and Snowflake. I think this is a large enough market to go around. Now their marketing departments are certainly trying to, you know, emphasize the areas that they're not as well known for. And I think that slide is a microcosm of the entire story, right? When we're talking about data storage, and warehousing, that's the stronghold of Snowflake. That's what they're known for. And when we're talking about analytics and AI ML specifically and data science tools, that's what Databricks is known for. We've known this story. So really what it's about is getting to the nuances of where the shift lies and who the swing votes are and how well they're doing with the perception and the marketing around these uh, tools converging. Now, a couple other things, we're not showing this data, but I went into the, um, the, the, the core data set, the raw data. Of course, data warehousing, prominent for Snowflake, data analytics, uh, but it was interesting to note, uh, and business intelligence too in reporting, interesting to note data engineering much, much higher for Databricks, and that's where some of the, the tension lies. A lot of the data engineering work, people are saying is they're, bring, they're doing that outside of Snowflake um, because of cost, and so we're going to watch that closely and see how Snowflake responds over time, potentially with a new SKU. Uh, to, to lower uh, the cost associated with doing some of that serious data pipelining work. Now, because we feel AI is enabling a new wave of data apps to be developed, and that is an important new vector of value for customers, as we said up front, we wanted to gauge how customers think about the appeal of the respective approaches that Databricks and Snowflake are taking. So this chart asks respondents to what degree they align with Databricks and Snowflake's approach and how they see the hyperscalers, specifically as it relates to building their Gen AI applications. And the data shows the percent of customers on a scale of one to five that shows four or five, i.e. agree or strongly agree with the conditioned response statements. And you can see more than 65% lean Databricks, about half Snowflake, but in interestingly, uh, Eric, more than a third said the hyperscalers have more capabilities than either of these firms in the space in AI and ML. Now, Eric, these are joint Databricks and Snowflake customers, so it's no surprise that those two are favored, but the prominence of the hyperscalers stood out, didn't it? Yeah, two things here. One, the question was written specifically about generative AI applications. So I think just knowing what we know about these two companies, it's not surprising me to see this particular question as worded, lean towards Databricks more than Snowflake, right? We've seen that in other ones as well. We know where their, strong, where their strengths are, but yes, these two are so busy competing with each other, and I think they got to forget to look in the, you know, look behind them because they got a common enemy here. Where thirty-four percent of their joint customers actually said the hyperscalers are better than both of them. So uh, that's something I think would be a message to both Snowflake and Databricks to, to pay attention to. All right, we further peel the onion, um, and push these companies to tell us if they had to back a company to dominate in AI, where would they place their bets? And you can see from this data, it highlights in the red, the percent of customers that feel each firm is somewhat likely to dominate and the green is very likely. So you add the reds and the greens and it's 48% for Databricks, 21% for Snowflake with 30% saying they're equally matched. So Eric, that's a pretty strong betting market for Databricks in this context. 
It is. Uh, again, the question was asked about specifically MLAI. So I think, again, it's probably not surprising that, that that's the way it was going to lean. If the question was asked just specifically for cloud data warehousing, you'd probably see the inverse of that. But as is written, without a doubt, there is a statistical movement more towards Databricks in this question. Um, and there, there really isn't much to say. I think the fact that 30% is still undecided uh, is enough of that battleground swing vote here that uh, you know both companies still have some work to do uh, before there is actual you know dominance or just one name here that is, is dominating the MLAI uh, market. Yeah, and I appreciate you sharing that nuance. And having said that, that's just, it's where the, all the action is these days, all the headlines, and so that's why we focused on it. So again, we we keep wanting to peel the, peel the onion, keep poking at this issue to see if customers are planning to shift spending, and if so, how. Remember, we've been reporting for a while, as I just uh, mentioned earlier, that anecdotal customer data tells us that some customers are moving some work, particularly the data engineering and the data prep work outside of Snowflake, because they feel it's too expensive and they can do it cheaper elsewhere. But this chart explores how customers are thinking about changing horses and to what degree. The question posed was, do you have any plans to consolidate your AI and data ops onto either Databricks or Snowflake within the next 24 months? And you can see 28% plan to shift uh, toward Databricks and 19% plan to shift toward Snowflake with 44% saying they have no plans to change. Now, Eric, notably only 4% of the respondents said they were phasing out Snowflake and only 2% said they're phasing out Databricks. But that's, that's still some, some plans to expand one at the expense of the other. And that is of note. What are your thoughts <clears throat> and does this fly in the face of our very, very politically correct title of not a zero sum game premise. This is where I would mention that uh, that person on Twitter calling out it's only a hundred shared customers right out of the thousands that they have. So is it statistically meaningful? Yes, there's no doubt there, there is a movement there. I agree with you that that four to 2% that are actually planning on just replacing or moving away from is nominal, it's low. So it's really, let's focus on that 24% going to one side and the 17% to the other. There is obviously a leaning there towards Databricks. However, it's not that massive. Um, there is still plenty of time here for this to change in perception. And the majority, 44%, are no plan to change, and 10% are still unsure. So this is a really fun data point from a headline perspective because it does lean one way or the other. And it's just kind of a, a fun question to ask about too, when we were asking about placing bets and which one you're going to consolidate on. These are the kind of headlines that are fun from a, from a survey like this. I would also add to your point that things change so fast uh, and these companies are, have, have established value propositions and pretty loyal customer bases that things can evolve and, and they will evolve as new features and products come out, uh, as new partnerships get, get, get enhanced uh, and, and, uh, and as markets shift, a lot of these perceptions will shift. Okay. Next, we wanted to assess the degree to which customers agree with a variety of statements that we posed. And in the interest of time, we're just going to focus on a couple of items and we'll let the audience digest the full scope of the data at their leisure. Uh, this chart again shows the respondents indicating a four or a five, meaning they agreed or strongly agreed to the statement, calling your attention to the first two bars, 86% and 76% respectively said security and governance were the first order decision points. And the next two bars basically say, we don't want to be locked in and we want open table formats, 54% and 50%. And that is juxtaposed against the next bar at 45%. Those say, we want to consolidate our data into a single stack with less tools diversity. But in the era of AI safety, security and privacy and governance are in the driver's seat. But notice all the way to the right, we have this smaller 14% saying security is less important to us than rapid innovation. Eric, explain why you called this the swing vote and why it's important. And then we've got another slide that we're going to bring up uh, that is very much related, but, but set it up please. This slide in general, I, I truly believe we probably could have done a full show on because what this is, is this is really getting at the crux of the matter. We can talk about if they're going to move, if they're not, but what we were able to do is take these reasonings. So this is all the sentiment. This is the way people feel about what they're using and which tool they're using. 
And we can actually go ahead and do factor analysis to see which of these answer options led to people saying they were going to switch. Because remember to everyone out there, this is anonymous data, but the people doing the surveys, we actually are able to correlate which answer was to the other one. So we're able to go a little bit deeper on this. And I know we have a slide, but the reason why that 14% is so important is it looks like the smallest amount of people, but they're also the ones that were signaling a move towards Databricks. So basically what that means is if you're really concerned with governance and security, and we're also hearing that from the end users, governance and security are sort of one and the same. They're not really viewing them as different, right? They expect that to be table stakes and it to be, you know, very well entrenched. However, that side group of rebels that say, I don't really care about it. What I really care about is the pace of innovation. It's those group that's most likely to lean towards Databrick. So that's the swing vote group right there. If we were doing this as a political poll, you would say that's my battleground. Those are the people I got to convince. So this is where ETR really shines and sets itself apart from your sort of so-called survey houses because they have not just a tremendous community but also a data science team to do some pretty sophisticated analysis. So Eric, please explain how you correlated the propensity to shift uh, 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 off of or to a platform with the previous data points. Yeah, I don't want to get too deep into this because we don't want to explain it uh, too difficultly. But what we did is we noticed two clusters of people. So we're calling them cluster one and cluster two. Then we figured out which factors were going to be the ones that were actually swinging people to move. So factor one showed strong evidence that security and governance are jointly prioritized. So that's factor one. Factor two showed a willingness to prioritize innovation over security. They're completely different. But what we noticed is the cluster that was more likely to align with factor one or factor two had a move. So what you're seeing here is that that 14% that we highlighted before that said that security is not as important as rapid innovation, those people were much more likely to lean towards Databricks. Inversely, on the other side here, you saw the people that were much more worried about security and, and, and consolidating their tech stack we're much more likely to move towards Snowflake. So what we were able to do here is basically take a look at all the different sentiment and find out which ones were most polarizing, which ones were decision makers. And that's where this factor analysis came in from. So basically the takeaways for the vendors here are for Snowflake, they need to find a way to go ahead and address those people that aren't security and governance first, but are actually more interested in a rapid pace of innovation first. Because right now that's the area where their sentiment isn't aligned to the marketplace. Great, love it. Thank you for that analysis. All right, let's shift gears and get into some of the data on open table formats, a key discussion point in the data community over the last 24 months. We asked respondents how they're adopting open table formats and then we show the results here. While only 15% are actually using open table formats today, only 30% say they have no intention to use them. So 70%, while it's still early days, indicate that they plan to evaluate and either are using or, or may use uh, in the near future. Uh, so when we, we then ask which ones are they using on this slide, you see the next slide, Alex, or planning to use, here's what we got back. So it's all over the map, lots of other. So probably, you know, you get some parquet in there and very possibly some answers that weren't specific to open table formats. Like I saw some responses like, oh, use AWS, um, but, what stood out to me, Eric, is that first, still lots of Hive, despite all of the criticisms around, you know, it's designed for batch, it's got latency issues and it's got all these limitations, it still has traction because it's cheap and it can handle big data and there's still tons of Hadoop out there. The other comment is that plans to use Iceberg exceed all other open table formats. And that's validation of all the talk that we hear around Iceberg. It's clearly catching the attention of data communities and is why Databricks acquired Tabular for billions of dollars. Tabular is the company whose founders created Apache Iceberg and is why Databricks is on a mission to technically integrate all these open table formats that it's been promoting. Eric, anything uh, you, you'd add here? Yeah, I think you have to look at these two slides um, in tandem because the slide one I think tells the story of eventually these are going to get used. People are excited about them, but many organizations, and remember this skewed large, we had half of these in the global 2000, 70 something percent were large organizations overall. 
they're not that fast to accept uh, open source, you know, to really go after it. So it's interesting to me that this is certainly the future. We know that Snowflake and Databricks have, have made, you know, announcements about this, releases about it. They're excited about it. They're certainly out in the market pushing it. I just would hesitate. I, I would just cause a little bit of pause and say, I don't think it's going to be as adopted as quickly as they would like to see. It will eventually get adopted, but right now it might not be the paradigm shifting game changers they think. However, now when you go to slide two, it's super interesting that Iceberg by far has the highest plans to evaluate and adopt eventually, but it isn't the highest that's currently being used. So I, uh, I just find that to be a little bit interesting. And I think it also tells that we just haven't gotten to full adoption yet. You're much better at this than me. And you're saying that Iceberg definitely is the future, but it just hasn't gotten caught up yet. So I think this just kind of just shows a slow arc of adoption in this area, as we've seen with many other open source technologies in the past. So um, we're going to get there. I just don't know if it's the same. It reminds me a little bit of the observability vendors and their open telemetry. They, they announced that and they thought it was going to be an immediate game changer, but the actual uptick in usage is a little bit slower than I think all of them expected. Yeah, and I would say this, the, the Databricks basically betting the farm on this. This is Ali Goetze's vision. And I think that they've got a fairly large community that is pulling uh, Snowflake into that world. Two years ago, they announced the intent to support Iceberg. And then this past year, obviously, you know, went, I wouldn't say all in, but they're in, they're committed. And I think that's just the evolution of markets. Now, of course, while the allure of open table formats is strong, when we ask customers, how are you going to govern the data that resides in Iceberg, for example, they really don't have a clear handle on it. So we wanted to go deeper and ask some questions around this topic which is what we show here. It's another set of conditioned response questions that force respondents in, into specific buckets. And it's no surprise based on the previous conversation that 37% of respondents said governance comes before open adoption. 29% of the respondents said they pick the right platform for the right job and they know how to manage silos. <laughs> we call them silos or us. Another 26% they prefer proprietary because it's more integrated and trusted and then just under 10% we're calling the data rebels. And as Eric explained earlier, these are a small but potentially important cohort, aren't they, Eric? Yeah, they certainly are. The ones that are willing to be those early adopters and those fast innovators, uh, you know, it, it's like any other aspect. You're either a Yankee fan or a Met fan, you're a Republican, you're a Democrat. The majority of people aren't going to swing. So when you find this group of people that are not aligned or loyal, but are really just looking for one aspect, you have to go find them and you need to go convince them to switch to your side. So that's what we need to see. Now, when it comes down to the specifics of Databricks and Snowflake, I'm not sure either one's in a better position because even their announcements, they're still very much entrenched in their ecosystem. So I'm not 100% sure if it's going to work. I think it's going to come down to slight nuances and functionality that that organization needs. Or again, at like the rebels, do they only care about innovation and agility? or is governance and centralized data source still more important to them? So I think as exciting as these announcements are, they still seem a little bit stuck within their own ecosystem and aren't really willing to reach over the aisle and grab the other person's users or, you know, or power users uh, to get them into their format just yet. All right, we're going to get down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but it's important to cover what's happening with governance catalogs because it was, as we said earlier, it's an emerging point of control. So governance catalog is a repository. It's a central repository that captures and manages metadata about an organization's data. Uh, so think of a governance catalog, it's got technical metadata. So technical metadata, things like the names of the tables and the columns and the types of data, it's, that's important for, for IT people. When they're technical people, when they're doing data integration, they got to know this kind of stuff when they're doing transformations. And a catalog, also can contain operational and business metadata. So that describes, you know, the lineage, who did what, when, what are the business rules, really important things like role-based access controls. Now, what's happening is while the point of control is shifting to governance catalogs from the DBMS, the value isn't necessarily going along with it because a lot of this functionality is being open source. So allow me to explain here. In June of this year at a summit, Snowflake announced that it was open sourcing Polaris, which is its technical metadata catalog. Horizon is Snowflake's catalog that remains closed source and it contains all the 
juicy governance capabilities like role-based access controls. In response, Databricks, one week later at its summit, announced that it was open sourcing Unity, which includes the entire scope of a governance catalog, both the technical metadata, the operational, and the business metadata. In addition, they bought Tabular. So we asked customers, did you know Polaris was open sourced? 39% said no. 8% said they're learning more and, and excited to, to learn more about Polaris. And 69% said they're unlikely to use Polaris at this time anyway. So this is important because if Snowflake can convince a larger number of customers to use Polaris, it'll increase its chances of getting folks to come into Snowflake to use Horizon. So Horizon requires you to be inside of Snowflake, Polaris doesn't. Now Unity was announced by Databricks at its summit in 2021 and has been iterating since that time. 44% of the respondents were not aware that Unity was open sourced in June. 47% are currently using Unity, so pretty decent adoption. Now among these uh, uh, 47%, 43% plan to increase their use of Unity. And among those not using Unity, 24% plan to increase it, its usage. And 40% of the survey on balance said they're unlikely to use Unity. So throwing a lot of numbers here, but despite all the, the bottom line is despite all the hoo-ha-ha -ha about open sourcing these governance platforms, to Eric's you know, point this past June, it was a big, big, big kerfuffle about this. A big chunk of these joint customers are not adopting from either of these two firms at least at this time. There are a lot of other options out there. AWS has Glue and Data Zones has a lot of governance capabilities. Google has, has capabilities. Alation, Calibra are specialists in this field. IBM has a governance catalog. Microsoft is trying to be Switzerland with Purview, which is essentially, uh, it, it's more than just a governance catalog, but it's, it's in part a catalog of catalogs, which is a, kind of an interesting approach. The point is, Eric, in my view, anyway, based on this data, all this fragmentation could be a good thing for Snowflake to the extent that governance remains a little tricky. Snowflake's value proposition of bring it all together and we'll keep it safe into Snowflake and we'll do the hard part. That could remain compelling. Anything you'd add here? Yeah, a few different things. So one, I, th I think that the overall disparity of options is good for Snowflake because it's not just becoming, like you said, uh, you know, a one player game in this at all. And that would have been bad for them. There's still plenty of other options. So that doesn't mean that it's just going to all coalesce around uh, their main competitor, Databricks. The other thing I would add as well is this is really going to come down to, you can open source all you want, but if there isn't, you know, controls, if there's not wrapped governance around it, then I just don't see it being widely used. It can be used as a niche but it's not going to end up landing and expanding in a large organization like, like the type of people we're querying here. I thought it was very interesting, uh, the, the factors analysis that we showed before. The number two that favored um, Snowflake was that the people who plan to keep, and I quote, the core intellectual property data on premise for at least another 12 months. And we know that a lot of people that are really use, utilizing Gen AI, they're using their most sensitive data to do so. Um, they're not just using, you know, random data that's off to the side. So that's the stuff that's much more likely to need governance. So while one is actually clearly being more agile and is clearly viewed as the innovator in that space, governance is still incredibly important. You, you mentioned IBM just anecdotally. They just blew out another quarter and they said it was Gen AI related. Now, some of that was consulting, don't get me wrong, but we are hearing and we are seeing even in our own core thesis data, how well they're doing in their cloud, in their containers, in their MLAI, particularly with you know, the OpenShift Red Hat stack. Um, there are other options. And I think as long as there are other players and there is sensitivity to the data that's being used, that's going to equal, you know, kind of even this playing field for a little bit longer. Yeah, I, mean, I just think they said they had a $2 billion book of business on, on AI. I think, they, I think it was Gen AI specific. I, I can't say for sure, it probably is. All right, let's share some final thoughts and then, and then wrap up. Uh, I'm going to run through this, Eric, and then ask for your, your final thoughts. Both Snowflake and Databricks are delivering significant value to their joint customers. You know, that we're seeing that uh, Snowflake, as we said, they're perceived as the safe bet. And, and Databricks moving fast, uh, but, but they, they don't want to break things. Big question is the degree, and Eric was really touching upon this, the degree to which open source, you know, governance is going to actually mature. Uh, and I, I think, you know, the, the, the mantra of don't bet against open source, I think has, has proven uh, uh, to be quite prescient 
Uh, but this is a really hard problem uh, and it's going to take some time to play out. You know, these swing votes from these data rebels uh, that prioritize innovation uh, first is, is actually quite interesting. And they could be a small but vocal majority, as they say. So that's something that we're going to watch. And in open table formats, as we said, while they're alluring, the jury is still out on how to govern them and how well open source is going to be able to, 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 to cover those customers' needs, especially those large financial institutions, uh, the large healthcare companies, which are big, big cohorts for uh, both of these companies. And, you know, last thing I'll say is, while well, Databricks and Snowflake are locked in this battle, as we said, you know, it could be a blind spot that the hyperscalers here uh, have a lot of capabilities. They're spending a lot of money on, on GPUs uh, and they've got a lot of the data. Uh, so when we talk about bringing AI to the data, a lot of that data is in the cloud and they're going to get their fair share. So Eric, uh, first of all, thank you for this collaboration. Uh, we're going to give you the final word. Yeah, that was a great uh, summary slide right there. You really did just pull out the key points. So this was a lot of fun to run uh, for everyone out there. We did this in about five days. Uh, joint customers collaborated with Dave and his team to get the questions done. And I think there's a lot of great takeaways. However, as sensational as the Databricks versus Snowflake headline is, we're clearly seeing here that for their joint customers, there's value in both. I don't see a huge need for either one to run in one direction or the other. And I think as long as these two are kind of pitted against each other, it might continue to benefit the end users, which is always nice to see for our IT community. Um, I do also want to state that both of these companies are incredibly well positioned in our larger data set, which is hundreds and hundreds of IT uh, buyers. So overall, um, Databricks had the third highest net score in this particular survey, and Snowflake had the seventh highest. They're both in the top 10, rarefied air, doing great. We just debuted Snowflake in the MLAI survey for the first time in this sector, and they came out with a 54% net score. So these companies are both doing fantastic. They're doing well for their customers. And it might be one of those cases where the, uh, the focus and the battle on each other is just beneficial to the industry as a whole. Eric, thanks again for spending the time and kudos to the team at ETR, the, the data team down there did an amazing job on very short notice. Really appreciate the, the quality input and collaboration. Thank you. You're welcome. I always enjoy working with you. So as I said, the, uh, the intent here was to do this before SuperCloud 7. SuperCloud 7 is uh, Tuesday, uh, July 30th. We're going to be running all day live out of our Palo Alto studio. The lineup is amazing. Go to thecube.net, check it out. I'll just give you a, a flavor for this. Ali Goetze is going to be there. Uh, as is uh, Benoit Dajaville Ali is of course the CEO of Databricks. Benoit is the visionary founder of Snowflake. Uh, and we'll be asking them for their reaction to some of this data. Jamak Dagani is working on a new layer to try to fill some of the gaps and, and lessen the confusion and complexity uh, for builders of data apps. Myself, John Furrier, Savannah Peterson will be in studio. Sanjeev Mohan will be there. George Gilbert's going to be there. Uh, we have uh, Renan Alak, from, from Vast is going to be there. We've got uh, Rohan from, from Microsoft who's going to represent Purview. Dipti's coming in from Microsoft. We've got representatives from uh, uh, TransUnion and also uh, Walmart is going to be on the program and much, much more. Go to uh, thecube.net, check that out. That's it for now. I want to thank Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman on production and on our podcast and Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com, and you can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com, DM me at dvellante, or comment on our LinkedIn post, and check out etr.ai. They get the best survey data in the enterprise tech business, and they do just amazing things like what we showed you today, with some of that deep, deep analysis. This is Dave Vellante for Eric Bradley for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis and at SuperCloud next week.